Skeptics Track at Dragon Con, where we put the science in science fiction. Hi, welcome to our panel. This is a science of science fiction panel in a way. So I'm Steve, Bob, Jay, Evan. Yep. You, <laughs> may, you may know us from the Skeptics Guide to the Universe, but Actually, um, this is a crisscross between the Skeptics Guide and J. Bob and I also do Alpha Quadrant Six, which is a science fiction review show. Um, and this panel, if I can get my microphone out to give me feedback, this panel is about common science fiction tropes. Um, there's a lot of different angles to this. We're going to focus on what science fiction has gotten wrong and we think gets wrong about technology, the future, culture, et cetera. Not necessarily just straight up science mistakes. That's a different conversation. Although we may talk about some of that, yeah, we may talk about some of that as well. Uh, but we're gonna talk about some common tropes. So that we're gonna break it down into three categories. Futurism, you know, the image of the future that is portrayed in science fiction in the past and in the present. Um, spaceships, space, everything to do with that. Um, how, you know, we're, this is a, a technology that we barely have, right? I mean, we have rockets, we've gone to the moon, um, but it's a staple of science fiction, so how do, you know, how do they extrapolate into the future? Um, and then um, some topics surrounding aliens. How do we think about what, because we haven't found any aliens yet, so we, this is, aliens are purely the stuff of our imagination, and that tells us a lot about what we think about things like biology and humanity and evolution, et cetera. Um, so starting with futurism, uh, Bob, uh, one, so one topic that we do discuss a lot on the show is how we think about future technology. How do we know what technology is going to be like in the future? So do you have a science fiction trope that uh, is the one that bugs you the most, you think is the most prominent, that has to do with this projection of technology into the future? Well, one thing we were talking about, Steve, is that often when they portray advanced technology, what they're, what they're doing is that they're, they're showing futuristic representations of their current, techno of current technology at the time. Say, for example, the, the bridge of the Enterprise. This is, that's, that's very science fiction -y for the technology at that time, but you'll notice that it's, it's really kind of silly when you think about it, as much as we love that bridge. I mean, the classic. When we visited the bridge in Ticonderoga, New York, it was a spiritual experience. It was like, oh my God. Yeah. We love it, but it, it is a little goofy if you think about it. For example, uh, nobody really, I don't think, I'm not aware of any, anyone that predicted digital technology, digital readouts uh, in, in, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. There may be, one or two one-offs that, that are obscure, but I'm not aware of any, and Star Trek certainly did not have any, any digital representation. They had that classic, you know, the rolling dial. No, it's all analog. analog. Yeah. It all analog, all and, analog, and when you look at it, I mean, it, it's Star Trek and you love it, but if you think about it, it's like, wow. I mean, really, 300 years? I mean, this is what they're using? <laughs> um, so so that's, that's one of the ones, that, that, that kind of thing. It's, and I like, I like what Steve said about that, it, it, and that's a really concise way to get think of it is that they're showing a futuristic representation of what they have right now. Right. And of course you can't blame them in a lot of ways. There's budgetary restraints and stuff, but there's, there's no one really thinking out of the box in many of these representations. Yeah, I, I think that's the key is that, you know, if we try to think of examples of science fiction where they imagined or predicted a major transition in technology that was reasonably accurate. Um, usually they're, uh, Again, they're just thinking of futuristic but examples of their of really the current way that they still do things. So you have a, a spaceship, and yeah, of course, there's always budget, and they're limited by the special effects technology of the time. We get that. But even that aside, um, and, it, and, and we've consumed a lot of science fiction, it's, a pretty, it's pretty much a staple that science fiction misses the true actual transitions and game changes in science. It's not just that they missed like digital computers. Um, they completely missed the, you know, everything about that. So you know, here we have a representation of cutting edge human technology a couple hundred years in the future. And even putting the technology, the special effects technology aside, there's, they didn't rethink the user interface, right? There's no graphical user interface. There's no virtual interface. 
there's no neuro interface. I think even, forget about it, even now we would say, oh yeah, of course it would be virtual. No, but I think that's wrong, right? Yeah. That's, so we're then just extrapolating today's technology <laughs> into the future. Yeah. No, they, they would have something else entirely. And I could imagine some th things that, phases we may pass through, like, that you're just going to have you know, some kind of EEG reading your thought waves, and th there wouldn't be any need for a physical interface at all. But who knows? Maybe that won't work out. Maybe that, that doesn't turn out to be practical. Here's another, um, I just, this one just occurred to me, another bad extrapolation. If you look at representation of computer technology in the 40s and yeah. the 50s, especially with Asimov, um, and, a, and a, lot of, a lot of them, I think pretty much all of them did it, a lot of it was like they saw computers getting bigger and more powerful. So, okay, of course, in the future, there's going to be one big computer in the United States that <laughs> can run everything. And when yeah. we think of that now, that's ridiculous. It's, punch it's, cards, it's, right? the, it's an absolute opposite. It's smaller and smaller and ubiquitous. There's probably right. thousands of distributors in this room right now. Um, so yeah, they totally missed the vote on that. The vast majority. I'm not aware of anyone that's... Yeah, that was like that. in the 70s, or was it the 60s or 70s, where someone at IBM said, why would there be any need for more than four or five computers? Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> um, they just didn't think about changing the way we use technology, right? And that's... I, that's a consistent, I think, science fiction trope. It's, a, it's especially visceral when you look at 1920s oh or God. 1930s visions of the future. We have, a, we have a video, I'm not sure if we're going to play it, I don't think we're going to play it, but... Um, it was a vision of the future, what they thought the future would be like. Yeah. 20, like, like the 20s yeah. and 30s, basically. Yeah. We'll, we'll reference that, and there's multiple versions of that. That was just one uh, that we were watching recently. But, in but it, it, it was... They're doing the things people do in the 1920s, just you know, in a more futuristic way. My favorite though one was, this is a little more to the timeline point, but they say, oh, in the future people will be you know flying from the, from London to New York in these giant airplanes, right? So first of all, it's still an airplane, yeah. right? In the year 2000, right? Not they missed jets, you know, um, but it also that it would be massive. And, and you would race across the Atlantic in a day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. yeah. So what is right. that? It turns into about 50 miles an hour. <laughs> miles an hour. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, they just completely missed, you know, it's actually, you know, it's not going to be that big, and it won't be this luxury liner. Because again, they were thinking luxury liner, right? Yeah. They're thinking that they're, think they're, they're transposing an ocean cruiser mm -hmm. to an airplane. Yeah, what right. they didn't realize was that the airlines are going to do everything they can to make as much money as they can, and you're not going to have a living room on an airplane. Right. You're going to be crammed into a seat. You know, and I, you know, everyone's been in that situation. You're like, you know, you're literally like this. Now, I, I don't really think. I want to point this out before we continue. We yeah. get the irony. Like 50 years from now, people are going to be looking at the things that we thought, and they're going to be laughing at us too. Absolutely. Right. I thought that their vision of the future had a very cool, romantic look to it. I really loved the the, the Art Deco design of it. There's something romantic about it. But it is really comical on how many things that they missed. One that really blew my mind was they showed a bride of the future. And the voiceover, I mean, the costuming was pretty cool that they came yeah. over. I thought the costume was, was fine. Yeah, but her dress was made of glass. Have you heard of that one? Like, <laughs> well, well, it's an idea. I think it was an aluminum dress. But thing. the voiceover was like, this bride to be looked sharp, searching for her new husband. It was just, it was so misogynistic. Yeah. But to, but at the time, of course, it was like everyone watching it. Yeah. Like, of course, yeah, you know. Yeah, we'll come back to that because we have you know one uh, section is on extrapolating culture into the future, which is perhaps even worse than extrapolating technology yeah. into the future. But we'll we'll get to that as well. Any other examples of things that science fiction missed? Like, what were the big technology changes? I think the digital. One is now because now that we're on the other side, we look back and go, like, oh, "Wow, it's totally different." Okay, this, this is this is the internet, and yeah. The web. I oh yeah, know. nobody, nobody sure. does. Right. So communication, like, almost everyone. And, yeah. uh, and also, like a couple of ones, uh, miniaturization. You know, the cell phones kept getting smaller, and one day somebody said, "This is ridiculous. We need to be bigger." And now they're going the other way. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the classic. thing, this has to do with Star Star Trek and Star Wars. They put the bridge. Explosive. Yeah, I can't help myself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Stick to the script. I already, I already started up there. Okay. <laughs> the bridge is on the outside of the ship. It's the, the you know, all the Klingons have to do is shoot at that dome on top of the Enterprise. <laughs> and, and Darth Vader is standing at a real window, like <laughs> in the middle of the ship. Yeah. Right. And put, put shielding around him. So, 
It, that's stupid. <laughs> it's worse than that, which we'll get to when we get to that part of this part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Minority Report was interesting because the Minority Report is uh, one of the more, I think, realistic, thoughtful, let's just say thoughtful, mm -hmm. extrapolations of future technology in a number of ways. But, but they, and they did get the graphical user interface right, but that's because they are, we already had it. Right? Yeah. They didn't yeah. anticipate that. They extrapolated that into the future. One and it's thing, already starting to get crusty. The one you know, thing we said about this was, you know, he's at his job and he's going nuts. You know, if you see the movie, he's really on that screen or using the gloves to interface with the, the, vi the video on the screen. Right. Imagine doing this for eight hours. Standing up. It just wouldn't work. You know, you, you, you know, the whole thing about us sitting at a desk and you kind of creep down and you keep going and you sit there, which so many of us do, especially programmers. Like, we, you really can't have your arms suspended Jay, in the air now. I had shoulder surgery in March. I could not do that. I would not be able to perform my job. I'd like to be out of a job. Oh, you had shoulder surgery? Sorry, you can't work a computer anymore because you can't be doing all this for eight hours. That's ridiculous. And, you know, you... Uh, this is the 2040s, you know, so you yeah. would argue that would be onto, would there be a virtual office at that point? We, can, we don't know, but again, they didn't make the next step. They just sort of extrapolated our current technology. You board. would have a mechanized suit that would be powered to help you with the, uh, the strain of the limitations of the human body yeah. being able to yeah, do those I things. That. Yeah, that's, that's a thing that I think also, um, you know, so they, they should extrapolate into the future what we can do and not necessarily what people will want to do, or it would be economical or, or, or physical. My favorite example of that, which I know we've mentioned before, is video phones. Video phones are a staple of science fiction. As, if, as soon as we're able to you know, technologically communicate with voice and video, that, of course that's what people are going to do. Um, but in fact, it's, we can do that now, and nobody video phones. People are, in fact, they went the other way. They, they'd rather text than talk, yeah. let alone be looking at somebody, you know? The popularity of Skype now with Sandy, but yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's, right. it's, time, it's a yeah. niche, right? It's like, right. you know, FaceTime, uh, honestly, in my, in my social circle, the only time I know people who FaceTime were parents with kids, yeah. right? Yeah, my wife and I use it all. Right, so yeah, it's a niche where you know, kids want to physically see their parents, right? It's so why annoying. Do you think that is? Why do you think because it's, it's annoying. It's, a, it's annoying to have to, like, like oh, how do I look? I comb, comb your hair. And for me, when we do video, I'm looking behind me, like, all right, I got too many skulls behind me. You got to lose some skulls. That, 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 that zombie, I can't have him in there because I don't want them to see my zombie. Or maybe I want them to see my zombies, so I add more zombies behind me. You're trying to make your room look interesting, even if it's not interesting. It's like, it's annoying. Just text, bam, in and out. Say what you want to say. No video. The, the, the Jetsons might have gone. Yeah, Jetsons. So while the Jetsons had, vi had video phones, I don't know if you guys remember the cartoon. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Did you know the future? Um, the, uh, they had the video phones, but they also had like a fake mask you could put on your front. Because if you're like, like, she's all in curlers and they just got out of bed, like, uh, <laughs> and so they had like, like my face the perfectly made a fake face, which of course falls off at one point. But um, <laughs> yeah, but people, that's the thing. You don't want that when you're. It, what they didn't anticipate is that people will want to communicate with the least amount of investment possible, right? Mm -hmm. So when you text. You don't have to worry about what you're doing, what you're saying, you're doing it in virtual time. What you look like. What you look like. If your mouth is full of food. And yeah. even small talk is, is at a minimum in a lot of cases. Yeah. You don't have to you're, say, hey, what's new, how, you know, how's the weather? You, you know, know you're not going to get sucked into a conversation you don't want to right. have. Yeah. Right. And of course, it's because it's asynchronous, you just like, all right, I'll get to that later. And that's awesome, right? It's, it's kind of annoying to be to be witty and pithy and interesting, like in real time. It's like, oh man, I got to do. The, yeah, you, that's actually difficult. You actually, you know, think about your response and make it kind of better than it would have been spontaneous. So there's other, another thing about Minority Report. Like you know, the, you guys remember the movie The Roadways? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so they were kind of shaped like a horseshoe, and they were super fast roadways. You know, remember his car kind of spilling out, catching yeah. up on speed. So I thought, look, that, that may very well be doable when we have driverless cars and everything is automated, you know, maybe 50 years, 100 years from now we would do it. I just don't see us building roadways like that. Yeah, well, it's certainly too soon, but um, I mean, at least they got the driverless car thing. Yeah. They, right, they, made, they said, okay, we will transition to driverless cars. Um, the, the other movie that did that was Total Recall. Yeah, but yeah that it, stupid Johnny Cat. I know, guy. right? <laughs> that's that, that oh, Johnny yeah. Cat, like, we're going to have a robot driving a car. No, Wait, the car I robot, I robot. robot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the thing I thought was ridiculous. <laughs> At one point, 
why didn't Arnold pull the, the yeah, thing out? Oh, yeah, he had the joystick and he's driving a car. But I realized that that robot was driving the car. Like, yeah. just make it all under the deck. Right. <laughs> like, why would the robot have to have a physical manifestation? Well, that's, that's the one car. of the tropes of projecting technology into the future is you take what's familiar and you do it in an advanced way, right? Rather than say, no, you don't have to do it that way. But it's like the car is a good example. The car was a horseless carriage, right? So they built it like a carriage and it had all the features of a carriage, but it just it was an engine inside right. of a horse pulling it, right? Um, so it's the same thing. Like we, when we have plastic, we make the plastic look like wood because that's what we're familiar with. And they call it horsepower. Yes, right. horsepower. They call it horsepower. Yeah. One horsepower. Um, all right. Let's talk about that. We, we keep you know, mentioning the timeline, mm -hmm. um, and that is something uh, that is another common trope of science fiction because. If you're, if you're going to set your story in 100 years, or 200 years, or 50 years, or whatever, you have to think about how quickly will we advance. And what is, what is so common, it's beyond a trope, I mean, it's, yes. it's, it's so common. Um, true. We, we, it's a truism. It's axiomatic. Right? You tend to dramatically overestimate short-term progress and dramatically underestimate long-term progress. Can you give us an example? Yes. So 2001 <laughs> Space Odyssey, right? Thank you. Uh, I understand. Oh, okay. Yeah. That, that is a little bit artifactual because the, the millennial, the year 2000, was a sort of a psychological break. Sure. Right. So anything beyond 2000 was mentally a lot farther in the future than it really was. Yeah. So I get that. But even you know, not crossing the 2000 barrier, we still see it. I, almost every movie Space I see, where, you know, where they're extrapolating into the near future, way over extrapolating. Right? They're, they're setting something 20 years in the future that really should be 100 years in the future. Or you more. Know? Or, you know, or more. Well, so like in 2001, they would have a fleshed out Earth, we have a moon base, and we're sending ships to Jupiter. Well, this was in the 60s, correct? Yeah. yeah. So that was a solid 40 years away. Yeah. And I can understand people sure. in the 1960s. Yeah, but it's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> we're not going to be there 40 years from now. Right? Yeah, it's not just wrong. It's right. crazy wrong. It's, crazy. Apollo, it's 200 years. Apollo 8 went out when this movie came out. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. So we're just barely sticking our toe in that water. Yeah. Yeah. But it seems. I think it's the it's the bias of progress, right? So you you say, well, we're making progress, so we're going to continue to make the exact same progress that we've been making, mm -hmm. right? So now we're landing people on the moon. So the next step is to build a base on the moon. And then the next step after right. that is to go to Mars and then to go to Jupiter. And it's not crazy. It's just that. It's not thoughtful. It's not real. Okay, like why are we going to do that? What are the economics of doing that? What are the things that could, the million things that can go wrong? You know, how hard is it really going to be? Well, so I mean, are we reducing this down to saying like they should have said it was three thousand and one? Like, do you have a problem? I'm, I'm curious. Like, what do you think? That was a book. Do you? Three thousand. That was a separate book. But do you, do you have a problem with that? Or I look at it like I totally understand why they picked those yeah. dates. There's a there's a you know, there's a writing. Well, as I said, two thousand and one. Was a psychological number, right? So, but, but like even like Minority Report overcalls it. Um, there's lots of shows, you know, that where it's like 2017. Really? Like, like 20 years ago, they were projecting yeah. to the 2000 right. teens. Like really? I mean, that's the date part. thing doesn't bother me. Like so many other things really bother yeah. me. But the date thing I kind of get because I think when they pick a date that's far enough in the future, but not too crazy far, that's you still feel a connection to that, it. That's the key. If it's too close, we often have this conversation after we see a science fiction movie. I uh, will say, you know, that the time setting was actually pretty good because it was like saving 50 or 60 years where there could be lots of changes in that time. But if it's too close, if it's only like, say, 15 years away and they're showing some crazy stuff, it takes you out and that's, that's what's yeah. annoying. Like Westworld as an example, they don't really give you a date when Westworld is happening, but you do get the sense it's kind of in modern times. The original Westworld was the same way. It's happening now, you know, like in the 70s. It's happening. No, now. Westworld is definitely in the future, and they're very good about not telling you how. Right. They don't. Which is that's fun. my point. They yeah, don't tell like you. That. Does it bother you that you don't get a date? <laughs> no, I think it's good. It's yeah. a, I'd rather have the mystery than a stupid date. I have to try to tell you is that accurate or not accurate. <laughs> and the expanse you know, it goes 200 years in the future, which is great. 200 years is a perfect number because what the hell knows? You know, by then we're not. You know, it's going to be so far in the past as as a work right. of art. No one's going to be criticizing. It. And also, you can't blame the makers of movies. You can't blame them for, for not thinking, well, what are people going to think of my movie in 30 years? I really got to consider. No, they, they, they're only concerned with the release and the yeah. next couple of years. And anything beyond that is gravy. And if, and if it becomes a cult classic, yeah. that's wonderful. And if people are down on it because of the, the timing, so what? So you yeah. can't blame them. Well, yeah, but the thing is, 
that's a choice that they make, and I do think that that choice is not just based upon marketing. I mean, I think 2001 was, I mean, that's the exact thing. But right. I think that it's often, they, they really think that that's a reasonable extrapolation right. to the future. So like Blade Runner mm -hmm. was 2017, right, the first Blade Runner? Um, that was last year. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we're, like, we're the flying cars. <laughs> well, they, 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 right, not only flying cars, but like genetically modified humans, you know, to be yeah, uh, the 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 yeah, they're, they're, they are legitimately humans that have been created in the lab. Yeah, I mean, who, it's too, we can't even say how long in the future that is. That's probably at least 50 years. Yeah. You know? So they, they were off. You, know, you often they're off by at least a century. Yeah, wait, they got a couple of things, right? That girl with the snake, she had a plastic coat. I've seen people wear that coat. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. you can also talk about um, projecting the culture into the future. Okay. So, this gets back to what the Don't point that you were making. Don't like that. So, give me your agonizer. Um, what do you guys think of our costumes? Awesome. Awesome. It's only getting worse. <laughs> Steve said to me today, he goes, you know what, we should just wear these classic ones every year to be one of our costumes that we wear. Yeah. And then I said, yeah, and we'll keep putting more money into them, we'll get like costumes from Avino. Yeah. And then our friend Joel is like, you gotta get the guy that owns the Star Trek Museum to make your costumes. <laughs> really an optimistic vision of the future. And there's a lot of dystopian futures. That's fine, that's yeah. a narrative choice. But sometimes there are projections of the culture of the future that are not narrative choices. It's just a naive assumption about what the future is going to be like, right? Like, what do you mean? Like, the, the writer is like, oh, I think everything is going to be horrible in the future? Or whatever. Well, so for example, um, I think I'm going to, yeah, so this is an obscure science. Oh, man, I remember that. Movie. Saturn 3, you remember Saturn 3? Yep. Gosh. That thing had a tube of brains in yeah. it, right? It was like a big, giant test tube in the whole torso of a, of a, of a brain. Right, that's right. That's one of the things I liked about it, actually, because it was a, I hadn't seen too many movies that actually represented a, an artificial intelligence using a, a biological substrate like a brain instead of just like some advanced computer circuitry. So that yeah, was, so what happened was, you know why it went crazy? Because the guy that imprinted on his brain was, 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 was a psychopath. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. so they got, there's actually some things they got right in this movie in terms of extrapolating culture. If you remember, the, uh, the guy, the psychopath, you know, who was programming the robot, said to the couple who were on Saturn 3, was Farrah Fawcett and Kurt Douglas, Kurt Douglas um, was shocked that they were in an exclusive relationship. Remember he said something like, she's for your personal consumption only? Like that was a foreign thought to him. Oh my God. Remember that? So, but the point was, they actually went, they actually made a point of saying, yeah, culture's gonna be different in the future. It's not gonna be 19, whatever, 1970s, 1980s culture. You know, it, and it wasn't really a prediction so much as just saying, it's going to be different. Yeah. You know, it'll be something alien to us that the, like, the notion of an exclusive relationship will be foreign to yeah. an average person. That's very forward thinking. Yeah, but but at the same time, I remember at the end of the movie, they're they're uh, when they get back to the Earth, the Earth is like this black polluted mess, right? And it had nothing to do with the story, so it's not a narrative choice. It was just, oh look, that's extrapolating our industrial pollution into the future. Um, of course, and I remember thinking at the time when we were young, like, oh yeah, of course the Earth is going to be a polluted mess. Right? That was just right. That was just the assumption. Right? You know, we were extrapolating trends into the future. We, that's funny because that, that that's Steve's take is that when yeah. when when Farrah Fawcett from the spaceship looks at the Earth that it was a, a polluted mess. My memory. Now this is how old is this movie? A quarter century. This is yeah. Yeah. this is it, and, and who, who remembers this movie? And okay, I so it'd be interesting to hear what, what their takes were as well. But my take was that, because the way they represented the Earth, it didn't look polluted to me. It looked, something happened, something bizarre happened. It was something, black. something weird. I don't, I don't remember black. I remember weird, unusual colors, but not, I don't remember black. And my, my memory is telling me that it was like, something unusual happened right. that, I it was some gray goo or something. I remember it was pollution. Okay, I didn't, I didn't think this that. This is a dystopian future movie, without a doubt. Well, yeah. but, but it wasn't really in the narrative structure of the movie. Oh, it was it, it was bad. It was it was a very dark movie. I mean, at one point we should they watch had it. like a thing where people could to, to, could choose to commit suicide. Do you remember yeah. that in the movie? So I, I do remember that. I just remember Fair Fawcett and the robot. Why do I only remember those two yeah. things? <laughs> <laughs> so do you remember that the station was on IO? Yep. Which this yeah. this was that's how old it was. It was before we got back the Voyager images of IO and knew that it was a Complete volcanic mess. <laughs> there couldn't be a, a station on island. But anyway, that was just not knowing the assignment. But let's get let's get back to that 1920s video. So if you look this up on YouTube, there's like 1920s vision of the future. You'll see a couple of videos. Um, and 
it was a complete projection of their culture into the future. Um, and, and that, you know, I get that, I get that, because, but yes, it was totally sexist and misogynistic, right? Um, in a way that to us, it's like, oh my god, it's like so 1920, that they're not even questioning it. Uh, that would take a lot, I think it takes a lot, that's the hardest thing probably to do in imagining the future, is imagining how different are we going to be thinking about, yeah. you know, ourselves, our relationships, you know, like, um, that's that takes an actual visionary, I think. Yeah, even in our own lifetime, when you look back on what it was like, you know, we were, yeah. growing up in the 70s, um, the world was a very different place in the mm -hmm. 70s. We don't talk the same as we did in the yeah. 70s. We don't have the same types of conversations as we did in the 70s. Right. Well, we do talk about Star Trek and Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that's fine. And I, that's the, you know, it's fun to hear somebody's vision of the future from a cultural perspective. I, li I like it. But usually, I always say to myself, eh, nobody knows. Yeah. We don't know. We don't know what the hell's going to happen. But I do know that we're not going to be wearing flapper dresses in the year 2000. Yes. Right? <laughs> which, is, which was funny. That's no. actually the thing. Like, <laughs> silly. That, that was a fun one where they, the, the woman um, got her baby from a vending machine on the street. <laughs> what? That was, that was the... How, who loads that machine? <laughs> 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 Vendomatic 3000. All right, let's talk about spaceships. Spaceships. Yeah. Uh, all right. There we go. Right, here we go. Whoa. This, this is one of oh, my boy. favorite spaceships. Yeah, they, cool. they look the best. They're gorgeous. They're gorgeous. They're, they're meant, meant to look aggressive and kind of evil. Yeah, they're beautiful. I mean, yeah, sure. they're good. works of art. But they make absolutely no sense. <laughs> no sense whatsoever. It's my favorite example of thinking about technology from our own perspective. Because we're used to riding on ships, right? If you're on a ship, a boat, on the ocean, you're standing up on top of the boat as the boat moves forward. That's fine. That would never be the case in a ship that never lands on a planet, right? If ships land on planets, okay, you can talk about how to optimize that. And then I think Slave 1 is a good ship as well. But for a ship like a Star Destroyer or the Enterprise or... or Whatever. Or the, the Death Star. Or the Death Star, or Battlestar Galactica, or whatever. Any of the big ships from any science fiction show, I don't think, uh, I can't really remember uh, any major franchise, certainly, that got it right. You're, they're always standing up with the ship moving forward. You would never do that. You would always be standing up, you know, uh, perpendicular to your direction of, or parallel to your direction of movement. Right. right. So you would be accelerating this way with your, you know, into your head, so that if you would accelerate at 1G, that's good, then you're just standing in one, one gravity, right? Because acceleration and gravity are the same thing. So, or the, the forces will feel the same to you. Um, right? So, but, but we, but... Eh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I think no, you're going to say you that. I don't think you do. Um, actually, I've, I've read some science fiction, a lot of science fiction lately, and, and it, they were, the time period was in a... a it was the near future. It's the near future. So they, so they were, they were traveling through the solar system, and they, they had to deal with G's and and, uh, and acceleration yeah. forces and, and and chairs to to protect them and stuff. And it was a pain in the ass. It's a, that is hard, it's a hard, It was a horrible to, to experience that. And the characters hated it, and that's what we that's what we're going to experience as we start colonizing the solar system in the next in the next handful of uh, of decades. But I think once you reach a certain level, I mean, they clearly have some artificial gravity, which of course is nonsense, but they have artificial gravity. So, so they're not tied to the acceleration of their engines. Because think about it, when they're, when they're in orbit and when they're not accelerating, what are they going to do? They're going to float around. No, they, they have artificial gravity. Yeah. So I think artificial gravity is a game changer in terms of the, the <laughs> make of the ship Even and the orientation if, of the ship. I see, you were going to say that. Even <laughs> if you have artificial gravity, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you use the acceleration? Why would you have you, you would still wouldn't you would have artificial gravity? You have to so you think, eliminate the the force from acceleration. Right. Yeah, it's but be in the exact wrong way, that. it's going to be pushing you over. I mean, I, I guess it makes sense that as you as you accelerate, you would lessen the need yeah. of the artificial gravity, which is probably you do that. But you can, the energy. But if you can generate artificial gravity, you could also lessen the acceleration forces. I don't know. It's just like, you know, it's a yeah, it's I think at some point when the technology re reaches a certain point, it's it's a little silly to, to start arguing from a low tech perspective what what the, the decisions that they would make with their with their fantasy technology essentially. Yeah, which is yeah, what it is. 
Yeah, that's I see what you're saying. I mean, well, wait, 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 a format that works. I agree with Bob that the floor, the floors would have to have that artificial gravity built into it. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I really, I think it's a split here. Now, those ships do enter the atmosphere. We saw in Rogue One that one of those star destroyers. <laughs> they, don't they don't land. They don't land, but they're protected okay. by the, the gravity. They're getting right next to the surface of the Earth. But they're in orbit. What? But they're in orbit. No. If, you're, if you're in orbit, you're, you're falling. You're not in orbit. You're not feeling. You're not feeling the gravity. gravity. You're not feeling it. Is there, am I, did everybody remember the yeah, Star Destroyer yeah, yeah. was over that city and they were they were moving the Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah but so true. so you're over the city and you're you're vertical. Wherever the engine should be pointing down. Why weren't no. the engines pointing down? Alright, I'll give you that. Fine. And if the engine can point you down, you should be standing up away from the engine. But it would look stupid. It'd be like me. That's <laughs> <laughs> well, it would have to look good to us. Yes. Right? But that's that's, that's the point. But so, it wouldn't. It but, wouldn't. It's a but I'll give that to you know, this isn't this isn't hard science, this is fan this is you know, space opera. That's fine for Star Wars. I understand that, but this is just an example. But this is true in yeah, every science fiction movie. Come yeah, on. they all every science fiction right. movie. Yeah, they're much. they're they're designing spaceships like they're boats <laughs> yeah. floating on the ocean. And they're rather than thinking, all right. How is this technology being used? If you were designing a ship, not to get not as a horseless carriage, but as a car, right? Not as a flying ship, but as a spaceship unto itself. Mm -hmm. That's the point. The point is we don't think of new technology as a thing unto itself. We think of it as a new way to do something old, and that that you know constraints our thinking about it. And science fiction is the best way to see those constraints because when you think about it, it's like yeah, ships would never be designed that way. The thing I like about this design is that it's very ergonomic from an acceleration point of view in terms of the ship itself, right? You think about the, the structural stresses on the ship and the lines of force, a, kind, a wedge is a perfect shape of the ship, yeah. as long as you were standing in the correct direction. You build your decks this way, not horizontally. Now, don't you think the engineers would say, all right, so every time one of our ships gets attacked by X-wings, they blow up the circular pods that, yeah. have, <laughs> that they would move them or put more shielding around them, and they don't do it. Explain that. That yeah. really pisses me off. You're right. The, the bridge, again, because the bridge like on, on a, um, a battleship or whatever is on top, yes. right? So yep. that's a battleship in space. Yep. But it's not a battleship in space. That's a spaceship. Yep. And so the bridge should be in the middle of the ship, the most shielded part of the ship. I said that. I don't, I don't say you. I agree. I'm agreeing with you. And you wouldn't have windows. You have cameras. You have freaking cameras, right? Yeah, I never understood that. Where they're standing at the glass, and, you know, and the ships are flying by. No one's like, we should get the hell away from this place. Because <laughs> <laughs> people have died. There's that one scene I love in Star Wars where Darth Vader's talking to a bunch of and the one guy goes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah. Get away from the glass. And to be fair, did you guys know that the Enterprise had a command center toward, towards the yeah. centrally located on the ship? Yeah. That was the interesting bridge. thing that they the had. The battle bridge, yeah. Had well, and also, I, that, this is one of the reasons why I love the board cube. Because it's right, it's just not what you expect. Yeah. It's yeah. not a ship. It, it actually makes sense in, in space. Oh, in space? In the vacuum of space. Love the board. Duh, everyone loves the board. Come on. <laughs> right? Come on. Did you see the two board guys I saw last night, Jay? Yeah, there were two really guys cool. dressed as boards that were all the costumes ah, were great. Yeah, yeah. So no, you're right. That's that's and there are exceptions to everything that we're saying. There are people who break the tropes. Yeah. And when they do, like good good on you. A cube in space is perfectly yeah. fine. Yeah. Why wouldn't you do that? Doesn't have to be aerodynamic. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well Alright, so say well uh, alright, so say I mean I'm not talking yeah. fantasy science now, I'm talking yeah. real science. I mean if you start traveling at relativistic speeds, then the, the, you know, the little gases in space, yeah. the little dust particles, and actually could be a problem. Yeah, you have shields. Um, yeah. They have shields. They have shields. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Shield. right. Yeah. So uh, you, you can make an argument for some sort of you know, aerodynamic shape in, in space if you're traveling you know, at relativistic speeds and don't have a warp or something. But they, have, they have shields, yes. But and without the, shields. Yeah, the Borg orb, you know, the, the Death Star looking type of thing, they, they have those as well. Is that better? <laughs> the, the, there's a Borg sphere. There's a Borg sphere. I own three of those, yes. <laughs> so then you should know what I'm talking about. What does that have to do with what I was I'm saying. asking you, is that better than this <laughs> cube? I just want to know. Oh, is that square? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 well, what shape should it be? 
it, I guess it depends on, on the mechanism of your propulsion, but... If you, so, yeah. yeah, whatever. If you're just warping it, it doesn't matter. Okay. All, All right. are wrong. I want to leave some time for questions. Let's go to our third topic, aliens. Okay. So, non-alien aliens. This is the thing that bugs me about science fiction more than anything else. I'm going to go to the picture. All right. So... That bugs you? This is the problem, Steve. What I, is the I problem? Have a serious problem. Is that she's wearing clothes? What's the what's going on? No, so, or whatever. So, all right. This is this is my example. So this is this is the closest species in the universe to us, mm -hmm. right? There's nothing closer to us than a chimpanzee or yeah. maybe whatever. Depending on what you're talking about. Whatever. There's no there subspecies of chimp. So it's the other way around. Never mind, okay. <laughs> Off the track, though. Um, um, so, can anyone tell me if that's a male or female chimp? That's a female chimp. If you think that's a male chimp, clap or raise your hand. Like, clap. If you think it's a female chimp, clap. If you have no idea, clap. Yes. Yeah, you have no idea. Yeah. You have no idea that's a male or female chimp because there's no sexual dimorphism among chimps except for a little bit in size. The males are a little bit bigger than the females. So you don't know if that's a male or a female chimp. Do they know? I'm pretty sure you think so. That's a female. Yeah, right, that's the thing. In an alien species, you would have no ability to tell gender. Right? They wouldn't in, in any way recapitulate human you know, masculinity and femininity. Well, right? it's certain be gender. Wait, but in There would be no sexy aliens. Right. Oh, that, that, the disagree. idea I of a sexy alien is an oxymoron. I disagree. <laughs> How? In Star Trek. <laughs> Thank you. They all know where I'm going with this. In Star Trek, Steve, they, they said, and this is canon, yeah. that all the planets were seeded. Not Star Trek. Not Star Trek. Yeah, but you're talking in generalities. Uh, you're right. That's, that's, I'm sorry. So, yes, they, they, so the, the fix in Star Trek was that we're all related somehow. Yes. Right. There was some kind of hand sperm, you know, hocus is going on, yeah, right? which is fine. Okay. And at least do that, at least to have an explanation for why, and that, and that was a budget thing, like all the aliens are humans with prosthetics, right? right? That's why right. I, I understand that. There's a, there's a huge budget thing here. But there is something cool thing. about that. I like the way that Star Trek handles it because, you know, and let's, let's cut to more of the storytelling aspect of this. I, I agree with you, of course. You know, real aliens are not going to have, they're not going to be bipedal, very unlikely, they're not going to look like us. But we're telling stories. I understand. Right? And, and we need to have a human face on an alien in order to, to relate to it. So, as with all the examples that we're giving, I think that budgetary limits, you know, special effects limits are a factor and narrative choices are a factor. I, we acknowledge that, yes. right? But I think even beyond those two things, it doesn't explain 100% of what we see in science fiction. There's also an element of just thoughtlessness, of just not realizing that, yeah, that's right, an alien species would not be male-female. In, the, in any kind of way that we would recognize as male or female, there would, there's no sexy aliens. I'm just that's just the, that's the reality, and it would be it would be nice to more often see aliens that were genderless to us. That would, that would be realistic. What is not necessary for the narrative? Yeah. Then, you know, the other thing is beyond that. Again, I, I understand this is big for narrative because we have to relate to the characters, and it's hard. So I will I mean, totally give it. It was worse than that because yeah. they're, they're, not, they're not just humanoid. They have human emotions. I was, like, I was, that was where I was going. They have human emotional expressions, and they have human emotions and yeah. human thought processes. They're just non-aliens. But I, I think it's only partly explained narratively. I think part of it is also that we are extrapolating ourselves onto the aliens. It's like a, a different race of humans. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, right. I mean, worse, much worse than that. But yeah, they're, yeah, they are like right. racing humans rather than actual aliens. <laughs> that, but that race did an okay job. They right? did, but you know, in the pilot what of what Babylon you? Five, mm -hmm. what's the name in Bari? I forget her name. Yeah, the she land. was different. Mira Furlan, right? Delenn. 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 Yeah. So you, do you notice that yes. in the pilot yes. of Babylon Five, Delenn was genderless. You didn't know if it was a male or female, and I love that. And then in the regular series, they made a female. They, they, and then later, you know, she marries a human, so whatever. They, uh, clearly, they did that for a narrative choice. But I love the fact right. that in the pilot, it was like, of course, why they, they wouldn't be male or female, it's Minbari, you know? Yeah. Um, but the Minbari and the humans have a connection, right? If you watch that. I know, and as I said, they, they changed it for, for narrative reasons. But you know, when there isn't that narrative reason, that would be a more realistic choice. But they got a lot of cool, they got a lot of cool things right. I mean, like the two 
the two master races that were left yeah. in, in the galaxy, you guys know Babylon 5, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. They, they, you know, I can't remember the name. Borlon and Shadows. You're Borlon awesome. and Shadows. Yeah. All right, so the Shadows were insect-like, and they were pretty much... Of course, they, insects have to be evil, right? Yeah. It don't look cute. The less human you look, the more evil you are. I was talking. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, Daniel. But I like that the, those two older races, they, they really didn't have human qualities. Yeah. Now, when that guy came out of his came out of that suit, Gosh. Kosh projected what you thought an angel would be, whatever culture you're from, which yeah. I thought was pretty cool. It's a good survival skill. But that. you know, we never even really see what they look like. Yeah. It's cool. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that Babylon Five is is the outlier yeah. in terms of showing really unusual aliens. The Orville and, and has a character that is a asexual, non-sexual character. Uh, the blob. The, right. The blob. Not the blob. No, but there's the blob. There's yes, the blob. there is that one. And there's also the fellow, the large. Uh, Bordis. Uh, yeah. Bordis. Bordis. Portis also. That is it. That, everybody's right, a Portis. That, yeah. that is it. I thought he was male, but all the, the race were male. Wasn't that episode where they kill all the female? They, they gender change all the females to males? Is that what they did? Yeah. Yes. Which is, a, you know, actually there's a lot of interesting things they do. In, um, and uh, Futurama yeah. actually has some characters that they've introduced that are like energy beings. And, yeah. You know, and, yeah. Yeah. But we have to, you have so to at least in those <laughs> that I understand why you feel the way that you do. Yeah. But I think you take it a little too far because, again, you know, if, let's say that they were all weird-looking aliens with tentacles, whatever, blah blah blah. Like, it would, you know, you wouldn't connect to it. Like, we connect to uh, Chewbacca because he's adorable and he's cool and powerful. Well, and this is, uh, so there's, there's a point there, but we also connect to R2D2, who's not has no. Damn, you're right. <laughs> no, so it's more challenging to connect to a non-human character, but it's worth it because then, you know, it, it, it's truly alien. But I have to. Bob brought up the race thing. I remember when I was younger watching a. Chinese science fiction movie, and where they were encountering aliens, and all the aliens were Chinese. <laughs> and I'm like, that's stupid. Why would all the why would all the aliens be Chinese? And I realized, well, of course, all of our aliens are Caucasian. <laughs> you know, right? So it's the same thing. It's just not. We should just switch and let our aliens be Chinese. Chinese their yeah. aliens be all Caucasians. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> A quick side story. Yeah. My my son, who's five. Um, he got to meet R2D2 and BB-8 here, you know, and he was talking to them. He legitimately thought that they were alive. Yeah. And I'm talking to the guy that created it, and he said it's typical, like that that happens, and the kids have this bonding thing with the droids because the, the droids are kind of childlike, and I think the kids kind of pick up on that. But I, that was the most adorable yeah. thing, and I agree with you. Yeah, we do relate to, to R2, but I have to say one thing: these are masterfully. You know, yeah. these are master level characters. You know, R2 yeah. was a stroke of genius by multiple people in order to pull that off. You can't pull off an R2 every time. I get that, but right. remember, um, and we talked about this on the show, that psychologists have demonstrated that we will project emotions onto triangles. Oh, okay. <laughs> they did an experiment where they had like a square, circle, and a triangle two dimensionally interacting on the screen, and there was a drama going on between these shapes. Yeah. And people told a whole story about the daddy's angry at the baby and the mommy's <laughs> protecting him and he's getting angry and aggressive. We have no problem extrapolating human emotions onto inanimate objects if they behave in a certain way. And so we don't have to make our aliens human in order for us to interact, to feel about them. It's just more challenging. Um, but again, I, again there's, yes, there's technology, there's narrative structure, but then there's just biases and assumptions that we are not questioning. And that's the part that we're trying to get to, right? Um, I think that's it. So we have 15 minutes left. We're going to take some questions. Let's leave the cool image of the ships on that. Um, so there's a mic set up, right, for people to come up and ask us questions. You can give us examples. You know, tell us, ask us what we think. Guys, try to keep it short, though, so we can get everyone a chance. Go ahead. Uh, so going with the idea of how we are able to project uh, our personalities onto like droids. Um, don't we also project like with Klingons? Oh, they're just like people, but angrier. Yeah. <laughs> people, uh, aliens are not going to think us. They're not going. They're completely alien. I wonder if you guys wanted to talk a little about that. Yeah, I mean that's uh, that absolutely a way in which aliens are not alien. It is that they they are often human archetypes uh, that we just project onto an alien species. And that brings up, although there's been some great science fiction, again, there's exceptions to all of these rules. I'm talking about the common, like the, the common denominator. 
Um, there is uh, the Gap series. Anybody here read the Gap series? Um, excellent. Is that the only books. I don't think they've ever made it in any kind of visual format. But there, those aliens were damn alien. You know, they had there was nothing human about them, and they, we couldn't even understand how they thought. Like it was a struggle to even get how they see the universe. You know, and we couldn't really. It was hard to infer their motives. So it made them much more menacing because we really had no idea how to think about their motives. Like so, Arrival as well. Yeah. Arrival is a, Arrival is yeah. a great example, right? But um, but I think that's a great question because. Yeah. If you love Star Trek, you love the Klingons are awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like the idea that we, they're accessible because we understand what he said. That right. they, they're like angry and they're they're you know they're very battle oriented and all that. That works. It just works. I, I yeah, would put that but, down. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Again, if, it, if, if, it's a, if it's a good narrative choice, yeah, we give them more leeway. It does bring up one other thing I want to say very quickly is that another massive science fiction trope is alien monoculture. Right? Mm -hmm. All aliens have one culture. And one religion. And one religion. Yeah. Remember Babylon 5 where they were celebrating the religions of all the species on the ship? And every species had one religion. And then the humans had 300 religions. <laughs> and every species would have 300 religions. They would have as much cultural diversity as we no religion. They wouldn't all dress whatever. the same. When you, they always do this. There's one, there's one whatever yeah. Yeah, culture for that. I get that. They, you know, if they're military, that makes sense. Yeah. But a lot of times in Star Trek, they just dress exactly the same. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. See, I'm wondering uh, what science fiction you think got the future right. Now, I would argue that uh, for ship design, Expanse probably. Yeah, Expanse, I think, is. currently is the best science fiction. It's hard science fiction. They, they, <coughs> they, they got the timeline reasonable. Yeah, who knows what the hell it's going to be like in 200 years, but it's far enough out that yeah, it's pretty reasonable, and there's nothing that I've seen in that show that was like, well, that's way too early, or they wouldn't be doing it this way or not. Uh, and they are definitely, the, the physics and space is a character in that movie. Like they have to deal with hard vacuum and acceleration. Gravity, yes, gravity, gravity on The Expanse yeah. is actually a character on that show. Yeah. It's color coded to show that this, these scenes are yellow scenes. That means they're lower, you know, low earth gravity. These scenes are red because they're, they're you know, zero gravity in, in deep space or whatever. They have to have um, Velcro boots when they're on the ship. Right, it, gravity, it's, it's amazing how the Velcro's right, you know, the, yeah. That they would be evolved to be a little bit different. Well, they're just they're developmental, not evolutionary, but developmentally they don't have the bone structure to handle Earth gravity because they're they're growing up yeah. at twenty percent, you know. And back to Babylon Five, in terms of purely pure space battles, Babylon Five is so much better than say Star Wars, which is still doing like these World War Two banks and things. Yeah, can't even compare. Uh, earlier, you were talking about um, timelines and people being able to see the future and extrapolate too far. Um, and I thought that Altered Carbon did a really interesting job of yeah. really far, and yet everything is still as shitty as this today. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to get your opinion on that. We agree. Altered Carbon was good science fiction. I loved it. I loved they, Altered they, Carbon. The they, books, I read all three books, wonderful, wonderful stuff. <laughs> so we took that premise of what if we have essentially our consciousness digitally in a computer, and then the body is just your sleep, right? It's in, the organic part is not the important part. The important part is the computer part that actually is your consciousness. And then ran with that premise, and I love when, when science fiction does that. Take a great premise and then... I, then I love that. In, in the books, and they did a good job of describing how culture would change given that technology. Right. And one, one scene just sticks out in my mind. Um, so you had, imagine this scene. Steve and I are, are, are getting together, and it's a hundred years in the future. So I guess I'm dead at this point, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, the SGU is having a reunion in the century, and the four of us have all different sleeves. We have different sleeves. We don't look the way we look, so we sit down, like, yeah, I'm Bob, yeah, I'm Steve, and like, okay, uh, but they don't necessarily believe each other, so what they do is, as part of the culture, there's this, there's this ritual that people do where they sit and they have what seems like a, a conversation, but the conversation over the course of maybe an hour or two or three is designed to tease apart memories and experiences and to confirm that you are who you say you are. And that's what people do when they meet in different sleeves after many decades. Oh, okay. They have a fun time, they have a conversation that looks convivial, it has the right word, but it has a very important cultural purpose. So one other, one other, wait, let me paint another version of the future. Yeah. So Evan and I are both captains of our own starship. Yeah. <laughs> Bob and Steve are actually like these salt freighter miners and they're ugly and disgusting. <laughs> and we just blow them right out of the sky, right? Yeah. Right. Um, we don't see that. But one of them, very quickly. So one vision of the future that I thought was very compelling, one of my favorite <coughs> science fiction genres is Dune. Yeah, yeah. And what, yeah. what Dune did 
which is very clever and it, which is woven into the narrative, is you know computers rebelled, almost destroyed humanity, so they banned all computers. So now it's whatever eight thousand years in the future, but no computers. And yeah, so it's, that for the most part, it's an interesting. Yeah, so it's a completely line analog line. future technology, right. like steampunk eight thousand years in the future. Right. right. And it's great because then that solves a lot of the extrapolation of technology yep. problems. Right. They're, they're the limiting the themselves. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I think you're, you're in such a straitjacket at that point that there are certain things that you just never would be able to achieve with, without computers. But then again, who knows? I mean, I could be wrong. I mean, so they just have to do biological I mean, technology. I mean. Yeah. What, what sense did you get from that, though, Steve? Was it really purely mechanistic, or was it just uh, uh, doing away with um, artificial intelligences? No, it was they, they were, no, it was, they, I mean, they were nothing digital. Human life was almost completely destroyed. Like they, they got rid of all. Oh, digital. I read all the prequels, and yeah, that was a nasty. <laughs> okay, next question, please. I was looking for examples that you enjoy where a show actually debunks itself. Mm -hmm. My favorite example of that is in Battlestar Galactica, the newer one. They can't make a Cylon detector, but Boomer can reach under a cabinet, pull out wires, jam them into her arm, and talk to the ship. Right. How do you not detect whatever interface that was? Yeah, right, right. So what examples do you have where the show actually debunks its own theories? I can't do this, but I'm doing it here. Why does that not work? Just like internal inconsistency yes, yes. and the extrapolation. They got it wrong within themselves, not, not in comparison to where we are now, and that they got the timeline wrong. But even within yeah. their own narrative, they ended up screwing it. Well, that, I mean, I think about that one. Yeah, it's like one of those seasons, there's a hundred examples, but I can't think of one. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Anyone got anything off the top of that? Not off the top, but I mean, I don't think that's, that is that uncommon. It's very common. Yeah. I know I've had that experience. But I'll go back think of one now. Like, in the uh, Star Trek movie, um, where they were able to, to, to oh, yeah. you know, teleport someone onto a ship that was moving at light speed, yeah. They, well, they were able to transport okay. light years to another planet. Yeah. Why have ships? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they had one movie, they totaled so much of Star Trek, I, I, I got to the crime. It's terrible. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, don't, you know, of course, we don't like that. It's just lazy, really shitty writing. They really yeah. write themselves into a corner. Yeah. All right, go ahead. Um, I wanted to ask your opinion of how Farscape did its aliens given that it's so much using puppetry and prosthetics. I loved it. I, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, loved, I loved it. And it's, it was interesting how I remember reading stories about, about um, oh God, what was his name? Puppet. Rigel? Rigel, yes, Rigel. It's been, it's been a bunch of years since I've seen it. He was, he was seen as, uh, this is by agency and how human yeah. psychology, he was such a, uh, a part of that series that when, that when they would end, at the, at the end of the day, they'd be done filming their scenes, and Rigel would just kind of do like, Bleh, you know, because the, the, the guy who controlled him wasn't controlling him anymore. And they'd go out and have drinks, and the character's like, yeah, I wish Rigel could join us, because he just kind of like laying there, <laughs> living in the corner. But he can't, you know, it's not a real thing, so that, that story just ends. Um, but I love, if, if you, I don't think you guys would be. I watched a couple seasons of Rigel. I watched the whole thing twice, and it was, <laughs> it was it's, a, it's a, come on, there's so many amazing characters. They had immensely beautiful, creative characters and puppetry and aliens that just blow your, that just blow your mind. I really recommend yeah, it. But it shows you that a compelling character could be a puppet, right? Sure. Yeah. You have to be a human being. Right. 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 They had most of them at the puppetry set. That's right. <laughs> good. I'd like to nominate District 9 as good aliens. Uh, District 9. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, fantastic movie. Really yeah. good movie. Um, the other uh, thing I do want to bring up is, why is it that you take one element of a planet and make it the entire planet? The like biome, yeah, we talked about that. Like Tatooine, <laughs> yeah. the whole desert planet. Well, no, the whole, you know, most planets would, if, if there's life on it, it wouldn't develop that way. Where's the oxygen coming from? Yeah. Right. yeah. Right. yeah. Right. There's no photosynthesis going on there. There's, there's, there's except the moisture vapor of Dune, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it has to be a desert, desert world. Yeah, like yeah, it's narrative. It's narrative. It's totally narrative. Totally narrative. Yeah, but it's but yes, it's but in it's true. It's in, you know it's everywhere. It's in all science fiction. I remember being in the Big Island of, of Hawaii, and I remember we we're taking a guided tour of the island, and the uh, the guide said that there's like something like twelve or thirteen climate zones on, yeah. on, yeah. on the earth in the whole, the Big Island. Of no, no, no. In the, the entirety of the Earth, there's like thirteen or twelve climates, and uh, the Big Island of Hawaii has nine of them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's yeah. an amazing diversity of, of climates. Well, that gets back to the monoculture thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, each planet is not the fully rich and diverse planet like 
plants are because like cultures aren't fully rich with diverse. It's got a stick and they stick. Yeah, they, they, they're, they're very cardboard in a way. But that, that's partly, I think, just, you know, if you've ever done any fiction writing, um, for whatever context or genre, you realize you just have to make you have to the, the back to it. Yeah. yeah, the back story has to be one level deeper than the, than the person will ever see, right? Yeah. And the reader or the player or whatever it is you're writing for them. As long as you have one layer deeper than where people are going to get to, it makes it seem infinitely deep. Tolkien was good at that. Yeah, Tolkien. That's why these you write. Tolkien wrote thousands and thousands of pages of backstory that never was part of the book itself because you had you had to do that. You have to create a world to then exist in. So it would be very easy to give the illusion of that a, that a, a race had a, a very deep and varied culture mm -hmm. without necessarily going through the yeah. work of fleshing it all out. Because yeah. you could, you could, you're always simulating, right? right? You're simulating that complexity, but you can do it. But again, it's just I think, think, oh, these are Klingons, Klingons are warlike, and they dress like this, you know, yeah. rather than this one aspect of it. It would have to be. I mean, who, who built stuff? For the Klingon. Who's the, who are the nerds that are making the shit? <laughs> there has to be Klingon That is such a awesome episode idea. Just think about it. There has to be Klingon in a lab. Who's a Klingon scientist? Next generation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Say that again? There was an episode where there was a Klingon scientist. Yeah, a Klingon scientist. No, you're right. But it's, it's, well, was he whippy? <laughs> a little bit. Was he on or engineering? Next question, please. <laughs> So my biggest problem with Star Trek um, is the fact that be careful now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my problem, I love Trek, but the problem I have with it is I've read a lot of the Culture series by Banks, and post scarcity societies I've thought a lot about. And I assume in a future where nobody has to work, um, the future is going to be a lot like Dragon Con, where people were just free to hang out and do stuff. And the way I explain it to myself is that when I see cultures in Star Trek, I assume these are the Republicans, because it's like the military or the people who are doing like sort of very directed, goal-oriented stuff. So that's the question I have. Like every tech, every society we see in Trek is apparently a society that's gotten into space and is taking care of a lot of their economic problems, mm -hmm. right? So. Where are the uh, Klingon cosplayers, everything else? Because yeah. people are free from the need, unless there's a strong cultural impetus to it, people are going to be free from the need to fulfill a military obligation or be in the Vulcan Science Academy. Yeah. So right. where is the post where is the post scarcity culture? Where are the, the Klingon cosplayers? opera though? They, yeah. did that, they did touch on Klingon opera in one, yeah. one episode, which I thought was but great. But there's no stuff too. There's no pop culture. Yeah, right, right, right. It's all for the old stuff. I know, but I think, you know, I think part of the problem, though, it really does boil down to like how much time can they spend writing and fleshing it out. Like Steve said, they just have to make the illusion yeah. of that. They just have to make one corner farther than the book. Right, right, right. Exactly, right. There's got to be. We're at right. right. two minutes. Well, we'll just take the last question. All right. Um, <laughs> you told us that we'll, there will not be a pretty um, elite. Yeah. Um, sexy, as in sexy. Yes. <laughs> pretty is different. Pretty, sexy. Okay. beautiful in the wrong way, but sexy implies that they are a gender. You want to make basically they're they touching our buttons right. that we evolved. But basically, the idea was that they will not look at like us. Yeah. But if you were extrapolate, how? What is the top species of the, on the planet? You would need to have a predator with the forward facing eyes or some devices to, to see. Mm -hmm. The way probably uh, the way uh, very um, movable appendages. So as you start progressing, you will get basically a human. Yeah, like a chimpanzee is basically a human. Right. <laughs> so. <laughs> Sorry, you're right. attracted to this chimpanzee. <laughs> 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 say, this is dragon kind of, yeah. that's good. Cool with that. But first, tell me, is that a male or a female? Who <laughs> <laughs> doesn't that? Yeah. No, but I hear, I hear your point, and, and, and that's an interesting, I think, point of debate. Is like how you, would a technological species have to have certain similarities to humans? You can make an argument, for example, a terribly biological, pragmatic argument, that the sensory organs would all be clustered around the brain. That makes sense. So having something like a head. Like you're not going to have eyes at the end of your fingers, because that's a long way to go you know, to get the information to your brain. So there might be certain biological constraints that would tend to settle on certain types of body plants, but that still doesn't get you anywhere close to a sexy alien. Yeah. Because at the most, you're going to have just like a basic body plan where there's certain symmetries that we would recognize. 
But again, I think there's probably a lot of other symmetries and planes that probably would work well too, and I think science fiction should explore those rather than just having sexy elements. So it's chips it's and grills aren't doing very they, they don't do very well in terms of survivability, not just because right. of uh, humans interacting interacting with them, but they're not they didn't hit up wild and popular. Popular. I mean insects, yeah. I mean talk about popularity I and mean, they're yeah. Guys, if you like this kind of content, you can go, uh, we're, we're developing the, the website right now, but you can go to our Facebook page, it's uh, facebook.com forward slash alpha quadrant and the number six. We have a YouTube uh, channel as well, we've, we've done like, you know, about 30 or 40 episodes right. at this point. We talk about this stuff, we talk about Star Trek Discovery. And at 7 o'clock, Crystal Ballroom, the full SGU, we'll see you now. See you there.